Good afternoon. This is, uh, my name is Henry Neufeld. I'm head of the Climate Change Unit um, at the World Agroforestry Center, ICRAF, in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya. And I welcome you very much to this uh, discussion forum organized by ICRAF together with FAO. And um, while we start going through a quick round of introductions, um, I hope that there will be more people coming in and uh, so that we take as much time as we can for discussions afterwards. The title of this uh, session is called Using Climate Smart Technologies to Scale Up Climate Smart Agriculture. And forget the practices, it's a bit of a tautology, but I, and I apologize. Um, climate Smart Agriculture has had quite a bit of a, um, let's say, it's, it's been a very shiny kind of brand coming up. Um, it's managed to unite sort of the development, the agriculture, and the climate change communities under one brand. And in doing so, it's raised a lot of expectations. Um, term has been around for about four or five years. There are a couple of publications uh, that have been put forward around climate smart agriculture, what it really is, what it could be. And um, still, we lack, we still do lack a bit of an understanding of what it could actually do. And this session here is uh, also meant to bring, shed a bit of light on that question. Um, there has been uh, a global alliance for climate smart agriculture, which was launched uh, recently at the Climate Change Summit in September in, the, uh, in New York. Uh, there was also, there's also an African uh, alliance for climate smart agriculture, and we will also talk about these um, to new institutions and what they can potentially deliver uh, in resolving issues around food security, uh, adaptation, and mitigation. So uh, let me just quickly introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, first, um, we have Alexandre Maybeck, who is a senior policy officer uh, on agriculture, environment, and climate change in the office of the Assistant Director General uh, within the FAO. Then uh, our second keynote speaker is uh, Todd Rosenstock, who is an agroecologist with ICRAF, and he investigates how smallholder agriculture affects the environment and society. Um, and then we have panelists here sitting uh, next to me. We have here, uh, sorry, where is she? Lami, in, I'm sorry, I can't, know, I, not, I can't get the name right. In, get, in Gwenya, I think, is she's a manager for communications and knowledge at FANERPAN, the Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, with 21 years of experience in policy research and advocacy. Uh, then we have Martin Boalia. He's the head of the Comprehensive Agriculture, Africa Agriculture Development Program, CADAP, within uh, NEPAD. And finally, last but not least, Austin Tibu. Uh, he's been working as a land resources conservation officer at Malawi's Ministry for, of Agriculture, Irrigation, and Water for over 10 years, and he's also the FAO focal point for economics and policy innovations for CSA in the EPEC, EPIC program. And then um, we will have Richie Ahuja, who's sitting here in front. He is um, an expert in business development strategies and spearheads the Environmental Defense Fund's engagement in Asia. Uh, he will be rapporteuring. He will give us a short summary at the end of the, the session. So without losing any more time, I'm going to ask uh, Alexandre to say a few words about um, what Climate Smart Agriculture is, some backgrounds, opportunities, and challenges. And then we'll hear what uh, Todd has to say about Climate Smart Agriculture, a panacea or prop propaganda. OK, please, Alexandre. So I, I will very briefly introduce or reintroduce for those of you who, who already uh, know what climate smart agriculture is, what the, the way we understand climate smart agriculture in, in FAO, which can be slightly different some, from some of the things uh, that are around more and more. And just 
extremely briefly giving examples because examples is probably the best way to understand what uh, climate smart agriculture uh, could mean. So once again, agriculture has to address a triple challenge, more food in quantity, quality, and diversity everywhere for everyone, adapt to climate change and contribute to mitigate climate change. The important point, I think, is that this triple challenge has to be seen at very various scales, global, local, and, and household. And we always need to keep in mind these various scales when you look at systems and, and what can be their contributions to climate smart agriculture. Growing demand all over the world, um, due also to, to diet changes, but especially in some countries and, and many of these countries which are already food insecure and which will be the most affected by climate change. And globally, worldwide, FAO estimates that production has to increase by 60%. Very briefly, main effects on cl of climate change on agricultural production, a decrease of production in certain areas, a change in the geography of, of production between countries and inside countries, and also and especially uh, an increased variability of production. So the, the impacts on, on food and nutrition security have, have been well described in, in the HLP report uh, 2012 and now in the IPCC report uh, recently released with impacts on the most vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable people, mainly. And with impacts on food security and nutrition, which are much more than just decreasing yields. Decreasing yields and the consequences of decreasing yields. Changes of the geography of production, and so vulnerable countries having to import and price volatility and the combination of all these effects. So, Agriculture can also contribute to mitigate, and the way we see it uh, in, in FAO, given the fact that agriculture has to produce more, is to understand mitigation as a reduction of emissions per kilo of output. Globally, having emissions increasing less than production, and also uh, enhanced agricultural soil carbon sinks, which means sinks above and underground. So the concept has first been introduced in, in 2010. It's with the title of a brochure that FAO prepared for the, the Hague conference. One, so it's amazing how the, the word is now all over the place, probably because this idea that we need to address various objectives at farm level, at country level, and globally is really needed. And also, one other important point about the climate smart agriculture approach is that it is not only practices or systems, but also systems from an agronomic point of view, but also the policies and institutions and the finance which are necessary to enable these changes. So it's really the three of them, which to a certain extent why I, uh, climate smart, I don't know what is a climate smart technology. I'd, I'd rather think about climate smart systems. And when you try to take these three objectives together, food security, adaptation and mitigation, globally what we want to do is more resource efficient systems and more resilient systems. But be also careful to what we mean, want to mean by resource efficient systems. It's not only more crop per drop, it's also more income per drop, more jobs per drop in the countries where agriculture is the main source of jobs and, and income for the population. Which means that it is very country, local, system specific. The, the way you imagine the technologies and the way they are integrated in a system. And globally, what, what we think is that the trade-offs are not really between food security and mitigation or food security and adaptation, but rather because between increasing resource efficiency and increasing resilience. And this is where you have to look at trade-offs and synergies. 
An important point, which is why I was insisting on the various levels in the system, is that we need to increase the general resilience of food systems, which means the physical resilience, environmental, but also the economic and social resilience of the system. One of these dimensions being able to compensate for a certain time, but not for a very long time. But for instance, social protection can help farmers resist a physical shock, avoid them selling all their livestock, for instance, and enable them to recover afterwards. <coughs> but resilience has also to be seen at various levels, each level being able to compensate for another. The resilience of a household depends on the fact, also on the fact that they are diversified, the diversified sources of income, but also it can be compensated by social protection, for instance. Trade can play a role to a certain extent, provided that there is income. So that's why I, we were insisting on the need to understand how the various systems relate one to another. Household to the farm, the farm to the landscape, the, the farm to the food chain, and all of that constitutes various food systems. So, Really very, very quickly, and, and you'll hear much more about it after me, understanding climate smart agriculture has to be done on the ground, in the field, in, in, in real systems. So these are just examples of a brochure you'll find, you'll find downstairs, where we tried uh, to look at the various dimensions of the impact of a technique. In, in other words, and to come back to the title of my presentation, we believe that there are opportunities to have climate smart systems, more efficient and more resilient. But the challenge is to be able to properly measure the various impacts of the techniques, both environmentally, economically, and socially, and in various time frames. And these are very different according to the system. It's not the same if you introduce urea deep placement in Bangladesh, where jobs are very uh, low cost and you need more jobs. And in China, for instance, where job uh, labor is much more costly, so you need mechanized systems. And, and the impact on food security will be totally different in the various systems. And very often what happens is that, which is what, where climate smart agriculture makes the change, we've introduced a technology for a precise objective and we measure that precise objective. We have the baseline on water and we, and we measure how water is used. Very often we don't have the impact on economics, on livelihoods, on income, on social issues, on gender sensi sensitivity, etc. So these are some cases where we have them. Sustainable grazing for better livelihoods in China. This is an interesting project because in the beginning it was introduced as a mitigation project uh, to increase carbon sinks. But in fact, it is totally transforming the systems and the livelihood of the people and it's much more a food security and an adaptation project with a carbon finance component but it is this carbon finance component which began triggering the, the institutional changes. Uh, you'll hear probably more about these when, uh, after one. Insisting also on the importance of genetic di diversity, just as an example of things that, that we need in order to be able to react to uncertainties. And this is another very important dimension of climate smart agriculture. When we say increasing resilience, we mean resilience to everything because we do not know exactly what are going to be the changes in 30 or 40 years in, in whatever area. Landscape approach is also a key one. Um, I've already mentioned that one. And I will stop here to leave the floor to my colleague. Thank you. So what I'm going to be talking about today is trying to answer, ooh, it's cut off. Hopefully not all of the slides are like that. Uh, hope, what I'll be talking about today is trying to answer this simple or somewhat complicated question, climate smart agriculture or propaganda or panacea. 
And here, in like this title slide, this question is incredibly complicated, especially for climate smart agriculture. Because with climate smart agriculture, what we're talking about in many cases is multiple dimensions. We're talking about multiple practices. Here you can see it's agroforestry, intercropping, uh, conservation agriculture, improved cookstoves, as well as multiple outcomes. So we're looking at nutrition security, we're looking at poverty alleviation, we're looking at natural resource management. And so how do we even begin to think about and begin to analyze this type of complexity? I would tend that it's this type of complexity that has largely made the, in, in helped spur the debate about whether or not climate smart agriculture can actually achieve some of its ambitions. And it's because of this we need to pull back from some of the sort of idiosyncratic case studies and try to get to the real big issues that we can then uh, start to bring these, these topics to scale. So over the next about 10, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to be telling you about the initial results from a meta-analysis that, that we've been conducting about specifically to try to answer the question of how do farm management practices uh, affect food security uh, added adaptive capacity and mitigation. And so I was sort of inspired to take on this topic largely because I was seeing things like this in the news. Uh, the Global Alliance for CSA wants to reach 500 million smallholder farming households. Uh, the African CSA Alliance and the NEPAD Vision 25 by 25 want to reach 25 million households by 2025. This type of effort will require a Herculean change in how we as scientists and we as development practitioners actually implement agricultural development. And so, but the real question here is, what is the evidence base? All of this type of development initiatives is fundamentally based on the assumption that we have evidence for that improved practices, CSA, uh, will improve food security, uh, adaptive capacity, and mitigation objectives. Well, and also it's based on the fundamental assumption that we have some idea about the synergies and trade-offs between these different components. And so what have we been doing so far? We've been trying to make a sense of essentially what is a pile of disparate literature. And so we've been doing a meta-analysis and a systematic review of 65 practices and 15 indicators. And so when I say practices, we're not talking about the aggregate level of agroforestry. We're talking about things that farmers actually implement on the, far, on the ground. Leguminous and intercropped agroforestry, deep placement of urea, things that farmers would actually need that you can analyze individually and then also aggregate back up. When I talk about indicators, these are indicators of food security, adaptive capacity, or mitigation. Uh, for food security, we're looking at four main indicator categories uh, ranging from income, productivity, and, and such. In terms of adaptive capacity, obviously this is the hardest one. We're thinking about things like soil quality. We're thinking about gender differentiated labor. We're thinking about nutrient use efficiency, water use efficiency, and things like that. Mitigation is a little bit more straightforward. Carbon sequestration, uh, greenhouse gas intensity, and the like. And so what we've done is essentially we, we utilize discipline-oriented keyword searches in the Web of Science database, and we came up with 144,000 candidate papers. And with the help of a small team in, of, of master's level students, including Helena, who's in the audience here today, uh, we went through all 144,000 papers and s s tried to see how they matched our inclusion criteria. So here we were interested in whether or not there was a, they had information and data on a CSA practice and a non-CSA control, as well as whether or not they took place in a tropical developing country. So from that 144,000, we narrowed, in reading those abstracts, we narrowed it down to about 16,000 papers. And those papers, we then downloaded the full text and further analyzed them to see if they met our inclusion criteria. That left us with uh, 6,000 papers in which we had to actually extract data from that we thought were relevant to answering our main question, which is uh, climate smart agriculture, panacea, or propaganda, or in other words, what is the evidence base behind climate smart agriculture? So far, we've extracted data on about 20% of that. And so I'll be talking about that. Based on the numbers that we've already extracted, we presume that in the end, this database, which will be hopefully ready by the Montpellier CSA conference, if not a little bit later on in the year, will have about 120,000 individual data points in it. Okay. And so if we start, and so if we just start to map the, where the studies have taken place to see where and how and what information is available. These are the studies that we have. This is a random sample from our 1,200 studies that we've already looked at, um, where, they're, where they're actually located on the map. And these studies have 
they're talking about at least one indicator relevant for food security, adaptive capacity, or mitigation. You see that it's a pretty good global distribution. But if you look a little closer, you also see that there is some geographic clustering. That you see that in Western Kenya and maybe around Accra in Ghana, you know, there's actually um, quite a number of studies that are in a relatively small location. And what, so what does that mean for when we're trying to scale climate smart agriculture? Well, what it means is, or what it suggests at this point, is that we may have a biased data set, that our information base may be inadequate to be able to say uh, that this type of practice will have this type of outcome in a, in a new location. When we then go to uh, studies that have two practices, uh, or two that address two components of CSA, like food security and adaptation in the same study, the, um, the size of the data set reduces dramatically. You ba we basically lose 60% of the studies. And so why is that important? That's important because w what we know from about 50 years of agricultural research and agricultural for development research is that a lot of time interventions are place-based. So we can't presume that the types of interventions and the types of outcomes that we might see in one location are, are gonna be able to be extrapolated to another location quite easily. And so these synergies and trade-offs may not actually uh, be transmissible. And lastly, if we look at studies where we have all three indicators, may probably given this projector, you might not even see any up there, there's, but there's just seven dots. So we, we basically reduced it to less than 1% of the studies have looked at uh, all, th all three components of CSA in the same study. And this is, this is important simply because it greatly reduces our ability to characterize what is normally thought of within climate smart agriculture, which are these triple wins, these win-win-wins. When we start to look at the data and actually use uh, common meta-analytical techniques, so this is uh, the food security response across multiple indicators for six different practices at different aggregated levels. And that sounds a little complicated, but let me, let me go into uh, a little bit more detail. And so, wrong button. So this is an effect size. So an effect size measures the relative effect of the treatment to the control. And so anything to the right of that red line is a positive effect. Anything to the left of that line is going to be a negative effect. Uh, if it crosses that line, it's not significantly different than zero. And you, can exp you, you may have positive or negative control or negative effects. And so basically what you see here is that there's not only a wide variability for any given practice, for instance, in agroforestry, or, but there are some uh, clear winners the use of inorganic fertilizer seems to be quite positive. Uh, the use of increasing protein in livestock feeds as well. The interesting part is, is that in most cases, people are talking about climate smart agriculture at a very aggregate level. They're talking about agroforestry as climate smart. Well, as you can see in these top two, two panels, uh, if once you start disaggregating the data from agroforestry to actually leguminous agroforestry, the actual effect changes. And so I, I would argue that you would need to actually begin to think about it in this more disaggregate level when you're identifying things as climate smart. And lastly, let's, let's look quickly at some synergies and some trade-offs. And so this is just the synergies and trade-offs uh, for the adaptation and food security indicators that are, are in 130 random a, a random sample of 130 studies. So as you can see, there are only 55 comparisons in that, in that 130 studies, so that's back to the about 60% decline that I mentioned earlier. And everything in the red box in the lower left-hand corner is where you don't want to be. This is lose-lose. So about 6% of the studies showed that there were lose-lose effects between adaptation and food security. Uh, in the opposite quarter, in category, there's about 32% of them showed that there were actually synergies. So this is what everybody is saying is possible with climate smart agriculture. But equally important, 60% of the studies that we, that we looked at, and granted it is a small data set at this point, shows that there's equal or more likely chance of actual trade-offs between adaptation and food security than there are synergies. And so, so while today I've just really focused on a very small amount of our initial data, the emerging trends seem to be cle somewhat clear, that there's geographic uh, clustering of the studies, which would suggest that we have challenges in actually extrapolating the data. There is a likelihood that we will see uh, trade-offs as much as we would see synergies, as well as that there's large variability amongst 
and with and between in, and within individual practices. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So before we go to some questions, we'll have another uh, round of panelists giving their sort of views on what they've just heard, also just making some statements in regard to, let's say, the alliance here. So let's start off with Martin and then um, Lamy and Austin in that order. And um, I'll ask you to be fairly brief so that we have as much time as possible for questions and answers where you can sort of uh, elaborate more on any issues you might want to raise. Okay, so Martin, you want to kick us off, please? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, yes, it's working. Thank you so much, uh, moderator Henley. Yes, I'm going to be very brief, and thank you so much to the two presentations. I think they do give us a very good scope in terms of uh, the discussion. Now, and I pick it up from the messages, key messages out of the two presentations. Uh, and I would say, is it possible looking at what we've just heard in terms of what is climate smart agriculture? Is it possible then, or is it correct to say that in fact, uh, climate smart agriculture is just any good agricultural practices. <coughs> Anything that is actually good, and un underline the word good, is going to give us uh, productivity, food security, is going to give us adaptation, is going to give us uh, mitigation value. Uh, and sometimes when you look back into uh, what we have described and what we've known as good agricultural farming, uh, when we say climate smart agriculture, are we saying anything different? What is new in, in this? Uh, and I start by saying uh, that yes, in fact, there, there is something new, there is something different. Uh, one of the first important issue is that uh, uh, in dealing with and talking about climate smart agriculture, we want to go beyond just the issue of uh, securing productivity. So this is more than just productivity issue. There is something that is actually very, very clear about the threats that climate change, or the opportunities that climate change bring on the whole spectrum and space and productivity and on the food systems. So you're looking at the, everything that we're doing in terms of farming practices, or what you call agriculture, and look at how far is it going to support uh, enhancing ability to deal with the new uh, emerging trends and, and uh, threats, opportunities that are very specific to the uh, occurrence of climate change, climate variability. And this, again, is about understanding the actual risks, which are actually going, are, are very localized, is appreciating the actual opportunities that you attribute to, to that climate change. Uh, the second point I want to make is, uh, is that when you look at climate smart agriculture in terms of what is different uh, and in terms of those practices, it is actually that is something that is compelling beyond, we talk about holistic, uh, comprehensive approaches, but in climate smart agriculture, we are seeing a very practical uh, compel to look at uh, agriculture to look at farming in a very, very integrated, holistic. Uh, and I like what the, the moderator was saying in the beginning, that is more than just climate smart technologies, but that we, we look at climate smart uh, systems because it's about uh, practices, it's about yes, policies and institutions, as you mentioned, resources, but it's also about managing the trade-offs in terms of different constituencies, but also the trade-offs in, in time and space. So what are we doing today vis-a-vis uh, -vis what are the needs, requirements of a future scenario? And the last and the third point in terms of the practices of climate smart agriculture is actually the value and the one issue about climate smart agriculture 
is actually how much it should bring back the value, the benefits into the local circumstances, both in terms of environmental resilience, social resilience, but today, especially when you look at Africa, the issue is how do we support the communities to harness their resources, land and water, in terms of increasing access to economic or expanding economic opportunities and, and actually enabling them to move in that spectrum towards a, a prosperity. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Um, we now have Fabiola um, Munoz Dodero, who is the executive director of the National Forest and Wildlife Service, SERFOR, here as well. Um, it, it, it's a pity she couldn't make it to us a little earlier because she missed the, the presentations, but I'll give her the, the chance of listening to the respondents so then she can make something out of that and uh, we'll have more chances to hear afterwards. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming anyway. It's been, it's great to have you. Lami, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when I was being introduced, they said that I'm working for an organization where we're working in a policy space. I would like to throw that into the discourse of you know, climate smart agriculture. Uh, I listened to the presentations and I also listened to the presentations before this session I mean, yesterday. What I'm seeing as a missing link, it's the enabling environment that we all agree that it's part of what will make you know, our efforts for climate smart agriculture to be successful. I just want to share with you uh, the experience that just we had uh, with our organization where we did uh, some scoping studies in 15 countries in Africa, Southern Africa and East Africa, to see how the countries are actually responding in terms of you know, the climate smart agriculture debates and also climate change. What we are seeing is that, that the countries do recognize that climate change is there. They also respond to the, to the calls for climate change. And most of the discussions are hosted by the ministries of, of environment. What we have seen with the ministries of agriculture is that uh, out of the 15 countries that we, 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 we did the scoping study, there were about four or five where they have policies that speaks specifically to climate smart agriculture. So as we discuss, I would like us to, to look at how we can actually accelerate, you know, really for the countries to have the enabling environment that will complement what is happening on the ground. So we find, you know, this disjuncture that, you know, on the ground there are a lot of ex uh, experiences, there are a lot of practices that is happening, but there's a gap between what is being practiced and what the policies are saying. So as we discussed, we need to, to also accelerate on that front. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lamy. That's a very important point. And uh, Alexandra already mentioned it, that we need not only look at the technologies. That's very important. Uh, Austin, please, just give us your, your thoughts. Oh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, from the introduction, I think I'm the most tail end panelist here. Um, I am from the extension side of uh, all these practices. So I'll focus my comment on what it takes to scale up um, climate smart agricultural practices. Uh, I like the matrix that Toad presented. I think it's four dimensional. But as we go out in the field, the matrix could become 100-dimensional. Um, when we are working with um, the farming communities, uh, the issues of productivity, yes, they come in. The issues of costs, the issues of resource saving, environmental issues or indicators, and also the institutional uh, indicators that we have discussed in um, the presentation from uh, FAO. So, uh, when we are at that level, we must uh, make sure that um, 
all those indicators are satisfied, and that's the main challenge uh, that we face. Uh, in climate smart agriculture, we have observed that the, uh, those practices, uh, they do respond to as many of those indicators. And the, my suggestion to the meta study that we are conducting under ACRAF is that we should um, go on beyond the three indicators to satisfy what the farming communities need or what they expect from these practices. And uh, finally, uh, I'd like to suggest that we have quick policy briefs to our decision-making people, the politicians, uh, that crisply presents what we expect or what we suggest uh, are the winning solutions to the challenge that the farming communities are facing in the, because of the effects of climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. And that's very important for us to talk about the question of scaling up. I think we should hear uh, more about that. Um, it's one thing to know the benefits in terms of uh, adaptation mitigation and food security, but then the, another question altogether might be how can it how can we reach these millions of farmers that uh, Todd was already mentioning? Fabiola, do you want to say a few words with regard to climate smart agriculture and uh, potentially uh, your own experience here out of the country? I don't know. Sí, bueno, buenas tardes con todos y con todas. Me disculpo, además, tuve que reemplazar al ministro en otra sesión, entonces no pude llegar a la mía. Pero una ventaja es que parte de la información que se ha compartido con ustedes hoy día, yo ya la había visto en alguna otra presentación eh, con los colegas de ICRAF y con gente de CIFOR y con otros que venimos trabajando eh, en esto. Y una de las, yo quisiera comentar básicamente tres temas en particular sobre eh, tecnologías climáticamente inteligentes para una agricultura que esperamos se pueda volver climáticamente inteligente. La primera es el tema del reconocimiento de los saberes tradicionales, ¿no? que es uno de los puntos esenciales. Creo que estamos muy alejados del tema de eh, tecnologías que han sido utilizadas en el pasado y tecnologías que están siendo utilizadas hoy día, pero que en realidad no llegan a nivel de ser asumidas, por ejemplo, por aquellos que tomamos decisiones. Entonces, esta articulación entre el conocimiento tradicional que rescate esas tecnologías apropiadas y esas prácticas culturalmente apropiadas son uno de los elementos claves. ¿no? Y esto no solamente lo estoy diciendo como Ministerio de Agricultura y Riego, también esto tendría que estar, por ejemplo, en los sistemas de inversión, ¿no? con el Ministerio de Economía, tendría que estar en los proyectos sociales, con el Ministerio de Desarrollo e Inclusión Social. Es realmente el tema del conocimiento cómo se, eh, se incorpora en la política pública. El segundo elemento que, que creo que, eh, si estamos hablando de la misma matriz que yo he visto en algún momento y que ha sido presentada ahora, hay una serie de buenas prácticas y de eh, posibilidades que se podrían convertir también en política pública, pero que a veces en el Estado no tenemos, a ver, una de las cosas que se ha hablado eh, la conexión con aquellos que están haciendo investigación. ¿no? Hay un link que todavía no hemos podido, eh, un chip que de repente todavía no hemos podido cambiar, que es cómo convertimos los resultados de la investigación en algo que informe mejor la política pública. Y ahí yo creo que tenemos que impulsar un diálogo más intercultural entre esas prácticas para convertir a la política pública que promueve esta agricultura más inteligente eh, en cuestiones prácticas, ¿no? la, sabiduría, la sabiduría práctica de aquellos que finalmente han investigado, han logrado probar y que ahora deberíamos de adoptar. Y el tercer tema, y ahora sí voy a utilizar una sesión en la que, la sesión por la que no pude estar acá, una cosa que se está hablando ahorita con ministros de, de otros países es la importancia de poder incorporar a otros sectores que influyen en el tema de la agricultura o del manejo forestal 
que no son justamente ni el Ministerio de Ambiente ni el Ministerio de Agricultura. ¿no? Entonces, si en verdad nosotros queremos cambiar la agricultura en el país, tendríamos que incorporar a otros actores que también son tomadores de decisión y que definen política pública y que no son los tradicionales. ¿no? Justamente en esta discusión en la que estábamos, uno de los, de los temas que se discutía era, bueno, ¿y qué tiene que ver, por ejemplo, el Ministerio de Justicia ¿no? en una pues, discusión como esta? ¿O qué tiene que ver el Ministerio, por ejemplo, de Inclusión Social? Y en realidad tiene mucho que ver, porque eh, para darles simplemente una idea, en el Perú, si un agricultor, o sea, si una comunidad o un pequeño va a un área y tala ilegalmente, pone esa madera en un camión y se la lleva, el primer puesto de control lo va a parar y le va a decomisar la madera y probablemente... Ah, perdón. <risa> ok, bueno y probablemente lo va a denunciar, ¿no? y van a decomisar el producto que ha sido talado ilegalmente, que es madera. Pero si un agricultor hace exactamente lo mismo, retira la cobertura forestal de un cuarto como este, y pone maíz, y vende el maíz, nadie lo va a parar. Al contrario, ¿no? porque es un producto agrícola, aunque provenga de un área que está deforestada. Entonces, si los ministerios de justicia, por ejemplo, que dictan muchas normas vinculadas a estos temas, eh, no entienden ese cambio en la política, es difícil que podamos conseguir también desde ahí una entrada para sancionar, no al que está haciendo tal ilegal solamente, sino al que está haciendo una agricultura que tampoco es la, la correcta. Y eso tiene que ver con un tema de educación, tiene, o sea, hay varios aspectos y factores que entran, que entran aquí. ¿no? Entonces, eh, creo que que hay un nivel de articulación de política pública que todavía no está siendo suficientemente trabajado para lograr instrumentos que permitan tener esta agricultura climáticamente inteligente. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Haberme perdido la presentación, además. No, I think you added a very important element and gave some more sort of depth to the question of what contributes to enabling environments from the political perspective, and I think that was very useful for our audience here. So we have quite a bit of time for questions, and then, uh, so I'd like to take two or three questions at a time, and then uh, we'll give, a, give our panel an opportunity to respond. I have Jonathan here in the back. Um, yes, sir, number two, and we'll take one more afterwards. What? Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Cornelius. Um, a question actually for, for Fabiola. Can you introduce yourself, please? I Not did. the institution. Okay, sorry, Henry. This is Jonathan Cornelius. I, I'm regional coordinator for World Agroforestry Center based here in Lima. Okay, um, yeah, a question for Fabiola. Fabiola, your interesting remarks about the need to close the gap between research and policy. Yeah. And coincidentally, po possibly, um, in our institutions of the CGIR, we spend a lot of time thinking about theories of change and how our research can change what happens uh, to its intended, or rather can change uh, what our intended uh, users do, shall we say. In this case, how our research can change policy. What I'd like to ask you, as an as a, uh, implementer and former of policy, is to what degree um, the ultimate end users of research also have to come back down the, the, the chain of impact themselves and somewhere uh, meet the, the scientists as they try increasingly to work 
forwards in, in the chain of impact. Yeah? Um, I hope I'm being clear. What, what I'm trying to say is that as researchers, we are being asked to be increasingly accountable uh, for our research being implemented, for example, in changing policies. So uh, what is the role of policymakers in also coming back maybe towards researchers and for the two of us together uh, to construct um, that impact that we all want? Thank you. Okay, please. Yes, sir? And then the lady behind him um, as well. Uh, thank you. I'm Doug Boucher from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, my question is for Todd. Um, you, the graph you showed had what to me was a striking and even paradoxical result, which is that a, a very large uh, and quite impressive meta-analysis from the World Agroforestry Center showed that there was no significant effect of agroforestry. Um, but you were only talking about the effects on food security. What were the significant variables that affected uh, mitigation? Okay. Karina Pinasco, de Asociación Amazónicos por la Amazonía. Eh, gracias por sus intervenciones. Eh, coincido con Fabiola, en, aunque dijiste cinco, Fabiola, y solamente mencionaste tres de los puntos. Pero eh, voy a hacer un comentario que hice en la sala anterior respecto al tema de climáticamente inteligente, agricultura climáticamente inteligente. Por todo lo que estamos viendo, necesitamos que sea un proceso mucho más integral. Eh, tú mismo lo mencionaste, la articulación de los sectores, el tema de políticas públicas, conocimientos tra este, eh, eh, tradicionales. Y ahí venía la pregunta, ¿nos vamos a conformar con que sean eh, agricultura climáticamente inteligente? ¿Por qué mejor no avanzamos hacia economías climáticamente inteligentes, y eso va para todos, o modelos de desarrollo que sean climáticamente inteligentes? ¿Y cómo haríamos todo ese proceso? ¿Cómo empujaríamos todo ese proceso? Porque al fin y al cabo, por ahí creo que podría estar la salida a todo lo que estamos viviendo ahora. Ok, let's... Uh give the panel the, the opportunities to respond. Uh, and uh, yes, let's start with Fabiola and uh, then I'll pass it on to, to Todd. And um, anybody else who wants to say something to any of the other questions, please feel free. Okay, Fabiola. Okay, sobre la primera pregunta de Jonathan. Si no entendí mal, la pregunta es cómo lograr que tengamos desde el lado de los bueno, los políticos y los que tomamos decisiones en las instituciones, este acercamiento con los investigadores. Okay. Yo creo que en ambos lados, en el lado de la investigación y en el lado de aquellos que toman decisiones, deberíamos tener un poco más de humildad. Yo estuve hace dos días, tres días tal vez, en un evento en el Pentagonito, ¿no? en una mesa, y entonces les dije lo mismo que les voy a decir ahora, que yo sí creo que es importantísimo que la investigación nos ayude a tomar decisiones y que todas las decisiones que nosotros tomemos, o, ojalá en el Servicio Nacional Forestal y de Fauna Silvestre de Perú las tomemos con un sustento técnico. ¿no? Y que una cosa que me preocupaba es que nosotros hemos lanzado hace poco un concurso de posiciones y que todas las posiciones hemos reclutado como el 30% de esas posiciones y solamente hemos podido tener una investigadora. ¿no? Y entonces los investigadores no quieren entrar al Estado, ¿no? y ese es un problema. Y claro, una de las respuestas que me dieron en esa sala fue que fácil, el tema para solucionar este problema es que los políticos prácticamente dejen de existir y que solo los científicos sean tomadores de decisión. ¿No? Y claro, este, cuando uno escucha ese tipo de cosas, igual que yo he tenido esa misma discusión, eh, yo no sé si ustedes lo saben, pero yo soy abogada. Y ustedes podrán decir qué hace un abogado de director del Servicio Forestal de un país. Porque nosotros en el Perú en este momento estamos en un proceso de reforma. 
y mi especialidad es el tema de política pública. Y entonces una de las reformas que tenemos que lograr hacer es cómo se vincula justamente generar la institucionalidad para vincular la investigación de una manera sencilla con el Estado, la política pública. Y entonces la primera cosa que creo que todos tendríamos que hacer es aprender a respetar el rol complementario de los otros ¿no? y no mirarnos por debajo del hombro, ni los políticos, ni los investigadores, ni los economistas, ni los abogados. Ojalá tuviéramos, por ejemplo, más economistas, más financistas metidos en estos temas. Y creo que todos nos necesitamos. Y eso me lleva a, a, la, a combinar la, la intervención de Karina y la de Jonathan en este sentido. La respuesta que requerimos hoy es una respuesta urgente, porque no tenemos mucho tiempo, para tomar decisiones acertadas. Y las decisiones van a estar más acertadas mientras más investigación tengamos como soporte, mientras más sustento científico tengamos. Y entonces ahí la pregunta es si solo nos quedamos en la agricultura, y yo creo que no. O sea, justamente el tema aquí es cómo entramos, con el ejemplo que les daba desde el Ministerio de Justicia, pero también cómo entramos desde educación, salud, energía y minas, cómo entramos desde todos los sectores y creo que ese es en realidad el potencial más importante de estos dos días de trabajo, que es esa mirada de paisaje, pero no solamente en el paisaje geográfico o físico, sino en este paisaje que tenemos aquí. Si yo les preguntara, por ejemplo, ¿cuántos economistas hay aquí? ¿Cuántos economistas hay aquí? Dos, ¿no es cierto? ¿Cuántos ingenieros agrónomos? Vaya, un poquito mejor, cinco. ¿Cuántos sociólogos? Dos, tres. ¿Cuántos abogados? Y ustedes saben cuántos abogados definen la política pública en nuestros países, pero ¿a cuántos nos invitan? Si cada uno de ustedes, desde sus profesiones, Biológico. ¿Cuántos biólogos hay? Ajá, ajá, ¿no es cierto? ¿Y cuántos investigadores hay aquí? Ajá, ¿no es cierto? Miren ustedes, si cada uno de ustedes se propone adoptar un abogado, ¿se imaginan la revolución que podríamos hacer? Pero eso es parte de entender que el mundo ha cambiado y que nos necesitamos entre todos. Hoy día mirar la agricultura fuera del manejo forestal y fuera de la economía verde y es un error, nos necesitamos. Y podemos discrepar y estoy segura que vamos a tener diferencias, pero la puerta está abierta para sentarnos en la mesa y esa creo que es la gran ventaja de un espacio como la COP y de este foro de paisajes. Gracias. Okay, thanks for this uh, passionate statement, Fabiola. Um, and I think you're totally right about everything. Uh, t <laughs> sí, sí. Uh, Todd, why don't you just respond to Doug's question? I think it's an important question, Doug. Very easy to follow up. Great. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I, I fail to see the paradox, uh, mostly because I'm a scientist and I just I report what the data say. And so this is the analysis that, that we've done so far in the limited data set. What you see and what you saw in that graph is largely driven by the variability in agroforestry systems that are included there. There's border planting, there's intercrop, there's, there's legumes, there's timber species and all of that, which is why you see such a wide, such a wide range in the effect. And so I would, I would presume that before the end of the analysis, when you, we've included more data, um, that you, we, would, we would see a different effect how large that effect, positive or negative, I'm not, I can't, it's hard for me to predict right now based on my reading of the 1,200 papers. So. Oh, the mitigation effects, we haven't looked at those data yet. Okay, Martin, do you want to say something about the, the question that Jonathan raised in the context of science and policy? I think you might be able to add a few words from your perspective, maybe put it into the context of the Climate Smart Agriculture Alliance. Yes, thank you. Uh, indeed, that is an in interesting 
issue uh, and it does come up uh, all the time. In fact, in the, in the Africa Alliance, one of the work stream we have identified where we're saying we need to make a difference is on, is on, the, on the policy. We have one on the policy stream, but we have one which we're calling technical support. And this is the appreciation of the fact that, uh, and I think in Africa you can say the politicians are coming mm, quite a long way in respecting data, respecting evidence, and beginning to talk about facts and figures. And the problem is that these facts and figures, data, is not existing in the form, in the manner that uh, they can actually use it at the moment. And that is the problem we have. So the, the issue in terms of research is actually how we can uh, move and actually move very rapidly, not just in terms of uh, technology development, but also support the politicians to answer the questions they need to answer in terms of real, uh, with the evidence, with the objectivity that uh, is desired. And one of the things we are looking at actually uh, as, a, as a matter of uh, approach is that when you talk about climate smart agriculture uh, uh, and, and look, looking at, uh, at science, it's a very open space. There's a lot we need to know. But it's also clear that the climate smart agriculture we're talking about, in fact, as implied from the various discussions, is not the same as manufacturing a car in the laboratory and then take it out on the road to be used. The, car, the climate smart agriculture is going to be developed in situ. It's going to emerge within the road that you are using it. So it's how we move actually in terms of research approaches, in terms of research tools, in terms of the accountability of what research delivers to actually bring them into the field, working with the farmers, working with politicians, working with communities, and, and actually it's also because it's not just a technical issue, it's actually political economy, and, and those things will be critical in making a, a climate smart agriculture image the way we want to see it. We've mentioned uh, actually working with the CCAFs, we're working with FARA, and we're saying also that we need, in fact, just as much political economy research as we're doing on the, on the hardware, on the, on, the, on the actual agronomic and, and technological practices. Uh, moderator, if you allow me, just one more point. Uh, I wanted also to say that uh, uh, when you look at the dis <coughs> sorry, discussions on climate smart agriculture everywhere, even in the, this, these two days, of course, it's being emphasized in terms of the, the comprehensiveness, the integrated nature of it, the holistic aspects. Uh, but it's also linking to research to understand that uh, I think we have to be careful that we don't end up with a very perfect creation that is unimplementable. And, and actually, the, the excellency of the description of climate smart agriculture is not going to come out of a laboratory. It's going to come out of real practices uh, in, in the field. And I want to end by saying, in fact, uh, in that sense, that's why we need to listen more from what the farmers are doing, what communities are doing, and actually understand that if it's not broken, don't fix it. Brilliant. OK, I saw I had you, sir. Then um, I saw you first, and I don't know if you were there. So I have you three. OK, please. Introduce yourself, please. Can we get a, a microphone? Here. I was here first. No, I saw this gentleman first. He was uh, already raising his hand. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Doug Brown with World Vision International. Um, my tr question specifically to Todd, but I think Alexandro might be able to help with it as well. Um, your data surprised me a little bit in a way it was, but I think it's partly because it's a meta and a meta analysis, and of course you're looking at studies that were designed to measure food or productivity impacts or at resilience impacts, but they may not have measured the other ones, and so they're dropped out when you sort of start comparing to. Um, so there's a limitation there, I guess. But I was looking at the grid, the quadra here, where you have the win-wins, the lose-lose, and then the mixed ones, and I'm just trying to wonder, I know when in the FAO source book, we know that there's a lot of practices listed there, and they're not all equally 
climate smart. Some score better on two or three dimensions than others do. So I'm wondering if you can characterize what's in the upper right quadrant versus what's in the lower, the upper left versus the lower right, and what practices are dropping down to those things versus the ones which are clear win-wins. Okay. Um, and yes, sir, please. Now you'll have to go over again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I take about two minutes to share how we have achieved climate smart agriculture and benefited in India? Yes. Uh, okay. So tr if you would try to be very concise. So yeah. And, yeah. And, and I and would also try to be. I take two minutes. And, and try to frame a question yeah. as well. Uh, later on. But first I would like to congratulate Todd for bringing out a very precise analysis of what is happening and what benefits have accrued. And if this is taken further, then the world community will benefit. Now, Climate Smart Agriculture, we started in Gujarat, India, about 10 years back. And we called it as a new extension approach. It is prior to agriculture season. It takes place in all villages together, 18,000 villages. Team is led by agriculture, extension administration, agriculture scientist, input dealer, and market people. And they go and meet the farmers at their doorstep. Provide them information what crops they should grow in next season based on prevailing situation. Three inputs are provided to farmer. One is soil health and analysis, which I mentioned in the last uh, session, that what crops their soil will sustain based on the weather parameters. Second is, what is market demand for the crops? Which crops they should select based on the market? And where the quality inputs are available? This is backed by water conservation measure at village level, which is funded by the government with community participation. So not a drop of water goes out. 70% of our area is rain fed. Focus is on women farmers and rural youth. And rural youth are trained to identify what are micro enterprises uh, possibilities based on local agriculture produce. So it's a comprehensive approach, takes place every year prior to agriculture season. And what has happened in Gujarat, India, and which is now uh, going on all over the country, uh, the soil health card approach and everything, is that we had a minus 2% to plus 2% growth rate. We have now reached 9% growth rate in 10 years at constant price. So almost income of farmers have doubled and on par with non-farm sector. So if we follow this approach in a comprehensive manner, there will be less social turmoils which are happening in many parts of the world and people are trying to grab justice by brutality. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this comment and I'm going to ask uh, your, your intervention first, please. Okay, my name is Talent Dasim Tunzi, and um, I'm with Fanapan. My question is basically on, on coordination, taking into account that uh, uh, CSA is at a global level, and also we have got uh, the CSA Alliance at, uh, at, uh, at the African level. How are the coordination modalities? Uh, do we have uh, a, an implementation framework or a monitoring and evaluation framework at a global level? that resonates with other regions? And are we following a bottom-up approach in terms of coming up with those, uh, with those kinds of frameworks? And the other, co the other question is on the, on the CSA technologies. Do we have context-specific CSA toolkit or technologies that we have to really say this is what we call climate smart agriculture or it's just the three indicators that were showed here on, that indicate on food security, adaptation, and mitigation? Do we have practical context-specific um, toolkits that are talking to different ecotypes uh, in, in, in the different regions that we are operating in. Thank you. Thank you very much for this excellent question. So what I would suggest is that uh, Alexandre and, and Austin, you could try to respond to the Indian gentleman's point, which I think was very context-specific, and I think it makes sense to sort of look at the question from a larger perspective. Is it transferable? Can it be done elsewhere, you know, what are the constraints? And because we talk about systems that are context-specific, we need to make sure that they 
actually fit somewhere else. And then, Todd, if you answer uh, Doug's question, of course, and Rami, I don't know if you want to step in also looking at uh, the questions of coordination, potentially. So, Alexander. Um, so, th the first thing is that, which is why I was saying that we're a bit uneasy with this idea of climate smart technologies and climate smart practices because it is very context de dependent. It's ecosystem dependent, but it's also socially dependent. It depends how the communities are organized. It, it depends how the policies are supporting. It depends on the economics. And so from our perspective, what, what we need is, is having more examples of what has worked or what has not worked with the various impacts and why it has worked or why it has not worked. What, what, what is the context w which is around? The, object, the ultimate objective would be, I don't know if it would be toolkits, but information tools, knowledge platforms, call it how you want it, where practitioners or actors at whatever level from governments, policy makers, of development practitioners or, or farmers could go and have a look at situations which are as comparable as possible to theirs. Or one aspect of the situation is comparable to theirs. So that's the objective, and you're right, it needs a lot of coordination. This, is, this event is part of it. Uh, the huge work w w done by Todd is an essential element of that, uh, but there is still a lot to be done. But probably one, the biggest, from my perspective, the biggest mistake to avoid would be to say, oh, that's a solution. Just implement it top down. This does, doesn't, wouldn't work. And not only it wouldn't work, but there is a risk of having wrong impacts in another dimension. I think. One of the important things with climate smart agriculture is that we say in the beginning, you have to look at the three things. You do not necessarily need to address them at the same level. The win-win-win thing is a myth, maybe. But you need to look at the three, and you need to know what damage you're doing in another dimension when you want to do something. And that's probably true for all natural resources issues or, or even development issues. But and, and uh, yeah, maybe I'll, and, and this probably is part of why the quarter and, and what so many trade off, because it, it, it's not the same everywhere, but probably you, you'll be more able to answer it that way. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'll start uh, from where Ale uh, Alexander has stopped on the two kids, yes or no. Um, in some areas, we are trying uh, to draft some two kids or some messages on climate smart agricultural practices. I'll give an example of the EPIC uh, projects in Vietnam, Zambia, and Malawi, where we have looked at the, or we have started looking at the trade offs. Uh, in terms of mitigation, all those triple wins, mitigation, food security, and adaptation. And we have isolated some examples or some practices that are fitting well within those win-win-win. Uh, we are also doing some institutional mapping uh, on how to move on or outscale these practices. And we have... Uh, we are also doing some policy harmonization. I think my colleague Shema indicated that the, in some areas or some regions, we have a gap between the environmental sector and the agricultural sector, uh, from policy and institutional setup on how to handle uh, the issue of agricultural practices that are climate smart. Uh, from my colleague from India, uh, that's a very good example that he has indicated, and the, I'm happy that uh, a few months ago I was in Maharashtra, and I, I observed the same uh, best practices 
on what they, they were calling the advisory services. Uh, within Maharashtra, they were able to combine the water budgets, uh, the hydromet services, the weather forecasts, uh, the available water for irrigation, the onset of the rains, and the, the prevailing economic and social conditions, the markets, the agroecological conditions, the soil fertility, to precisely advise the farming community on how they can um, um, modify or improve their farming system. And I really agree with him that it has really improved the productivity of the farmers, but also um, the resilience of the farming system.